All right, so we're gonna get going. We're already about seven minutes in due to waiting a little bit to get people started. Today, we are focusing on present levels of performance. Um, today is a heavy content day. So there is quite a bit during the first half of today's session of just sitting and listening to the information that is being presented. Some of it is going to be um, a lot of review for many of you. For some people, there'll be some new information shared on present levels of performance. I think for most people, it might fall into the category of a little bit of a shift in thinking in terms of the way we've currently been creating our present levels of performance to how to do that um, even better and how the new CT said system is going to allow us to then present that information. Um, and for some of you, this may be brand new if you're a general educator or otherwise. So I'm going to just do a quick poll that I'm going to launch here on present levels of performance. And just in general, thinking about your background knowledge, your foundational understanding and ability to create strong and effective present levels of performance, how would you rate yourself? So gave us some information about how deep we need to go into some of the talking points on the slides. All right, I'm gonna share these results with you. So we do have a, a pretty good spread. Um, we have some experts here and we have some people who are feeling like they need a lot of work in that area. And uh, most of the most of the crew here today is in the middle. I encourage anybody and everybody to participate at any time, whether it's because you have a question, whether it's because you're seeing something that's a change in practice for you um, as a new educator or an experienced educator, or because you have a question about something that we're presenting and, and you had information that led you to do something otherwise and you wanna engage in that conversation. We definitely encourage that type of participation today. All right, April's gonna take it away with some content. We're gonna do that for about 30 minutes or so, and then we're gonna move into um, reviewing some documents, taking a dive into using some rating scales, and you're going to get to do some independent um, and group conversation as well. All right, so today, um, well, Sarah kind of mentioned the, the learning objectives <laughs> um, about what we're gonna do today, but really just you know describe um, the characteristics of effective present levels of performance, understand those critical components of present levels um, of performance statements and explain the process for accessing students' um, present level statements as they lead to development of a high quality impact statement. So those are, and we're also gonna look at um, its relationship to Andrew and the importance there as well. Sarah, did you wanna share the PowerPoint? <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Let me do that right now. I'm looking at it, so I assumed everybody else was looking at it, too. Um, are you seeing yep, it so, now, April? Yep, yeah, yep. So those are the, the learning objectives that I just kind of mentioned briefly. Um, you know, so we're going to talk about those three things and, and how it relates to um, the Andrew case. So moving on, um, you know, the CSCE definition of the present level statement, present levels of academic achievement and functional performance means a statement of the student's current level of achievement or development in an area of need and how the student's disability affects the student's involvement and progress in the general education curriculum. Um, you know, we really know that present levels change as students make progress on their IEP goals and objectives. Um, and when we talk about Andrew, you know, courts do recognize that when they're looking at those present levels, um, they change and what they're looking at is just kind of um, that current level of where those students, um, that student falls. Sorry, I just need to change my, okay, my, my viewing screen there. Um, as the present levels change, obviously they will impact those goals and objectives, services and supports, and it, it's expected that the IEP will be revised accordingly before the next annual review. Um, in addition, the statement is really emphasized on how the student's disability affects the student's involvement and progress in the general education curriculum. Um, all students are always general education students first, and the IEP is really dis designed to ensure that students with disabilities can access and make progress in the general education curriculum. So, um, 
here, you know, we're going to look that this is really like a cyclical um, kind of format here. Um, according to IDEA, there should be a direct relationship between the present levels of performance and the other components of the IEP. The present levels provide information on the student's current academic or functional needs that's used to inform the impact statement. The impact statement is an explanation of how the student's disability affects their access and ability to make progress in the general education curriculum. The impact statement also explicitly states the student's needs and how those needs impact the student's capacity to access the general education curriculum, including the need for specially designed instruction and interventions. Um, present levels are also used to establish that baseline data and performance criteria within annual goals to determine progress monitoring schedule. Um, progress monitoring data is then analyzed to determine students' progress and make the appropriate changes for the goals and objectives for the annual present levels. So it kind of just always goes in that kind of form, that circle, um, using that baseline data to inform um, those goals and objectives. Nice visual to help teams kind of remember that cycle of of work that April just described. So, right, what's the big deal? I, we looked at Andrew last week, you know, to meet its substantive obligation under IDEA, a school must offer an IEP reasonably calculated to enable child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. Um, present levels are really the foundation from which you can create an opportunity, um, an appropriately rigorous IEP that enables the child to make that meaningful progress. Um, last book, we really did look at Andrew a little bit, um, and it was really grounded in that substantive um, standard for IDEA. And the ruling really emphasized appropriate um, in the free and appropriate public education and increased the lower standard to some bit benefit to meaningful benefit. This means that the PPT really needs to pay close attention to the student's progress and that the IEP really must be designed after careful consideration of the student's present levels um, through the reporting of the baseline data to determine adequate progress. Um, you know, this really makes the present levels the foundational piece of the IEP really like where are we going with this information that we have. So just a quick little discussion. Um, do you guys believe that present levels and existing IEPs would meet the expectations established via the Andrew decision? So what do you guys think? What do you think about that? Like ones you've seen. Any takers? <laughs> For being more specific, I think it might help to ask, pose a more specific question. So when we think about baseline data, are do we have specific baseline data related to concerns in our present levels on most of the IEPs that you see? Are you seeing very specific, like they're at this level right now during this snapshot? Or are you seeing general statements about this is a concern and here's some data that sort of supports that, but it's not giving me a real true baseline? So this is Christina from Windsor. Um, I have definitely veteran staff members with training who do a great job, but I have 19 new teachers this year and a majority of them are straight out of college. Um, and I don't feel like they've been prepared in their, you know, point up into prepared to write IEPs and we haven't been able to give them that training. So I think in our district, it's like 50-50. We're, we're doing the best we can, but with 19 new people, it's just so hard to get everything, you know, right to the point where we need it to be. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for sharing that. That's a lot of new teachers to train. And your point about um, our new educators coming out of their pre-service programs without having had this training, one of the um, silver linings um, of CT says one of the many is that, you know, we'll hopefully be able to get some of this information into the hands of our universities that are doing the teacher training programs. Um, so that coming right out of school, people have this information and have done some practice and accessed it on a more regular basis. I appreciate you sharing that. Anybody else want to make a, a comment about um, either their own work around present levels or kind of what you've seen in your travels across your career? This is Jamie from Norwich. I would agree with Christine in that um, um, with our with our new staff, there's a huge curve in terms of writing an IEP that we would 
consider quality. And we've talked about like this training that you're offering to us um, would be so helpful to our new staff um, in terms of ensuring that, you know, we can be confident that our IEPs ha have all of the components of something that we view as quality. Um, and also a comment about our, our, our pre-service programs that we have out there, just a, a little anecdote. I had attended a job fair at one of our well-known universities that, um, you know, is very well respected. And one of my questions to some of the special education teachers that I bumped into were, you know, like, how comfortable are you with IEP development and how much time? And, and they all had like big eyes, like, <laughs> like, I'm like, okay, that means, just means that we need to give you more support when, you know, we bring you on board. But that was um, eye opening in terms of like how much we need to support them when they come in as a new, new educator, because it takes a veteran teacher hours to write a good IEP. Now we have someone that's new who's we're, we're starting from the from ground zero and the, there's only so much time in a week. Um, so I think those are things to important, you know, important things to consider. And um, my last thing was, you know, maybe when I retire, I can create that class for those colleges so that we can ensure our, our, our teachers are, are well prepared. Well, thank I know you. There's, there's, yeah, thank you, Jamie, for sharing. There's a lot of conversation about that and, you know, how we need to do that for all of our all even our related service areas, too. You know, how do we get people more access um, and our special education teachers? I appreciate the sharing that you both did. Um, for those of you who are veteran administrators or veteran teachers that are here, I love what Jamie just said about, like, if every new teacher could have access to this or everybody who's newer to the field, um, how that would increase the quality. And for those of you sitting through this, this training, Training with that lens, with that experience, I'd love for you to look at it that way. It's reinforcing the information you already have, but it's organizing it in a way that's going to lead to the whole, all 14,000 of us in Connecticut moving forward in the same direction at the same time. So thanks, Jamie. I probably talked too long, April. Sorry. I like to no, chat. No, it's okay. I just wanted to just mention also, Amy said in the chat, um, for some of my students, present levels is easier to include baseline data because it, it's in, embedded into our benchmark data collection throughout the year. However, for some of my other students, I find it harder to write specific baseline data because they don't have those same assessment as grade level peers. And I think that, that that's a... Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just... That's such a great point. Right. Um, that's... You're, you're spot on. It's almost... I like maybe you did you review the the PowerPoint ahead of time? If you did, I'm really impressed. Um, but if not, that's a really great just thinking on your own because we're going to look at both today, and I think that you're going to find through the activities that we do that thinking about some of like the behavioral aspects of present levels is different than thinking about some of the academic aspects. And so as we move forward, it's going to be interesting to see um, what we can access and how we can improve our progress monitoring, which will then inform our ability to write better present levels. Um, and again, that circle, that cycle we showed earlier will constantly be running. Yep. And then Amanda just mentioned, um, mentioned present levels not matching for some of the newer educators, not matching goals and objectives. Um, one she saw was marked not on grade level for the content area and goals were not created. So right, just some of those, some of those basic skills we really need for this quality IEP training, uh, writing. All right, so what is adequate progress? So I love this little graphic here we have. This is from the IRIS Center and it really just kind of helps, you know, guide this, um, this practice. So what does progress look like? So is the student making progress? If it's yes, right, we're gonna continue to monitor that progress towards that aim line to close those gaps. If it's no, is the student be, is the IEP being implemented with fidelity? And if it is, then maybe we need to go back and look at the IEP and say, do they need a different accommodation? Um, what do we need to change to um, make sure that they're gonna reach that goal? Um, and then if no, if it's not being implemented with fidelity, then we need to improve the fidelity. So we need to make sure that the services are being provided, the accommodations and modifications are being put in place. Um, so matter, no matter how much progress the student is making in their goals, this disclosure really highlights the importance of continued data collection and progress monitoring. Without the data, progress is just someone's opinion. The data is evidence and necessary to prove student, to prove student progress. 
Also, the school district can consider interventions through SRBI or MTSS process or 504 or non-IEP that needs and requires uh, needs that require accommodations. Um, you know, and just talking about Andrew, you know, it really goes back to, you know, districts really prevail when they have, you know, in court cases when um, that progress is monitored and we really can have that data collection and show um, where the students at and having that data is just it's so important. I wanted to additionally point out when we talk about data collection, just to kind of reframe and make sure we're all on the same page, and you're going to hear this multiple times throughout the training today, we're not just talking about curriculum-based assessments or assessments. There's other methods of data collection toward progress that can also be strong if they're objective um, and, you know, dri driven by evidence in the student's growth. So in line with the CT definition of ENDRU, there are four essential elements to, of a high quality present level. Student needs, baseline information, effect on progress in general education, and connection to goals and objectives. And these four elements just really ensure that the present levels are strong enough to inform the student's goals, objectives, and the other, other parts of the IEP as well. So now we're going to take a little look at CT says, just a little snapshot. Ooh, what's my thing doing? I notice April's avoiding saying the word flop. When you say it too many times in a training, it starts to sound wrong. So you you have to alternate between saying flop and present levels of performance. Uh, yeah, just, I really have a hard time with that. So you all know what we're doing here. <laughs> we're trying. Uh, so here is just a snapshot. Um, uh, for CT sets for these gold areas. So you can see the two red boxes, there's an academic area, and then there's a functional goal area as well. So in CT sets, you would just click on the area that you're um, identifying there is a need. There's also an other section. So you really have um, quite a few options here um, to choose for when you're gonna put in your goals and then subsequently your objectives. And again, there won't be drop downs here. These will be goals that we create ourselves. Um, okay, so here are some key components of the present levels. And here's just, it's kind of a comparison. So on the left-hand side, we have the current format that we're using. And then on the right-hand side is the CT says the new format. Um, you know, once these are selected, these are going to generate on your screen and they're going to be displayed through prompts um, on your computer. And um, it'll prompt you to document the student's present level of performance, strengths and concerns and need with that, that specific academic or functional goal area. And then the impact statement should include details concerning the impact of the student's disability on involvement in the general education curriculum or appropriate um, preschool activities and why specifically designed instruction is necessary for that student. Data reference, reference in the present levels will be provided from classroom and curriculum-based measurements and assessments. It's important to utilize classroom-based data that is often be the most recent data um, documented for student progress and data that can be collected as part of that progress monitoring. Um, we're really going to continue to go over um, the data needed to discuss the student's strengths and needs and the process to write a quality impact statement. Um, so we'll just take a couple minutes if you guys can look at the difference in format. Um, you do think, um, how did these changes impact the development of your present levels and impact statement? You know, it's not too, too different. This is Donna from Coventry. Um, I like the fact that they took out age appropriate because I think that was one of the more misleading, especially when you're talking about like your cognitive functioning, social emotional, sometimes there might be areas that don't look age appropriate, but when you look at the global picture, it's not not age appropriate. And if depending on how you mark depends on then what you need to do with your concerns and impact statement. So I like that they took that piece out of it so you can focus more on actually what the student knows or doesn't know. Yep, that's a great point. Thank you, Donna. Anybody else? Amy says, it seems easier because they are together as you are drafting. I hate flipping back and forth with the current IEP. <laughs> Absolutely. 
it'll be, I think it'll be user more user friendly in that way. We will pass along Jamie's thank you about removing age appropriate because we certainly didn't make that decision, but <laughs> we will pass that along that, that positive feedback. Thank you. Any other last minute thoughts as we move forward? I'm just kind of watching the time as we go. Um, Leslie? We can't hear you. Sorry. Well, now we can. Great. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, I will type it. No, we can hear you. Oh, she can't hear us. We can hear. Oh. Her. Okay. Um. Well, Leslie's typing to us. Is there anybody else that wanted to? Oh, my computer. Comment about the difference between these two things. No worries, Leslie. <laughs> All right. All right. So um, this is another snapshot of a different sec section on the CT SED system. Um, so here we're really talking about um, this, this section, additional data and assessment information is intended for standardized assessments and evaluation data. Norm reference data, such as the WIS, the Woodcock-Johnson, all of those would be entered in here. Um, so these, this information would be put in place and would, be, would stay in the IEP for three years or until the next reevaluation. Um, it is important to know though, all other present level data will be cleared out annually. So this means any observation data, curriculum-based measurements and other types of formative assessments will be gone each year. Um, but this, for this page here, this will stay for three years. Um, the, the big difference, and you'll see it's called uh, present levels of performance, additional data assessment information. There's a separate section that you're going to be putting in that triennial or uh, interim assessment information from your standardized tests and the other data you've collected. It will live in the IEP. It will print out as part of the IEP. I'll show you the IEP later where it lands, but it's not on the present levels pages that are the, the snapshot of where the student is currently that's aligned with the goal or objective. Can you repeat that? So every everything is going to be erased from year to year once we pull up a new IEP, except for the present levels? Everything, the present levels will be- um, For three years? Starting from scratch again every year at an annual review because you're, it's a new year. So you will have to be putting in new updated present levels of performance information, but the assessment, this other assess, assessment data that comes from your um, evaluations that you did will remain in the IEP for as long as it's current. So you don't have to retype this in every year because it would be putting the same information back in. The right. things that disappear will be the things that you would need to be entering new information for anyway, because there would be a new baseline. For where Are you talking about goals and objectives and all of that? The, the present levels, the concerns and the needs, the goals and the right. objectives, yes. I mean, there's sometimes when it just, it changes, some part of it changes, but you're, we're having to have everybody write it all over again. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Question, follow up to that. So if it's a triennial year, will you be putting your assessment data in both spots? That's such a great question. April and I were having this discussion for just before you all joined us today at two o'clock. And um, I am going to bring that question back to the, the team, the um, leadership team, the SDE and AIR. But my current understanding, um, which I'll correct if it's wrong, is that your triennial and other norm reference standardized assessment information gets entered when you have it in this in this section and doesn't get replicated on the present levels portions that go with that. And you're gonna see um, on the next couple slides, some examples of this that might help us better, help you understand what it might look like and how it might break down. That was a great question. Um, and if you evaluate prior to the new the, the three years, you can put new information in at any time when it's appropriate is my understanding. It's just not gonna automatically go away. Gotcha. Thank you. Again, those are answers to the best of my ability at this time because we're 
focusing on content and quality IEP development, not quite the system itself, but we do have some information to support your questions. Jennifer? Just a, a quick question. So I generally ask my teachers to update the, the present levels with any PPT. I mean, unless it's just a you know really quick one, but we, we do more than just an annual on most of our kids during the year, um, either because of parent requests or because of um, needing to review and revise. Is that, I guess when, when I'm hearing you say, you know, it's gonna clear out at the, for every annual review, but can we update Reg, you know, at, at other times than the annual review, can we un update the present levels? Because we can to. update so we're, them. We're, so we are bound to by law update okay, them. Okay, because we update them time. all the time. But I but just okay. yes, uh, all the time. Every time we have a PPT, we have to review our present levels and update. We just okay. I mean, there are some students who have PPT so frequently that some of the present level information from one month to the next may may still be applicable. But we are we are bound by ID. Okay, ID. I just wanted to make sure that wasn't changing. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, so again, we're going to talk more about the content than the system. That was just a, a system related comment um, so that you can think about the shift in practice a little bit. Great questions, guys. Okay, so when we're talking about different kinds of data that we use, sometimes present levels lack that sufficient data or multiple assessment sources. Formative and curriculum-based assessments are just as important as standard and summative data. There are two types of data that we should be used to inform the present levels. The first is quantitative data, or think of it, I always think of it as the, the numbers, right? The numbers that we get from those assessments. Um, and then the other type of data is qualitative or that descriptive data. This is a type of data that provides insight into root cause analysis and can be used to identify focused areas of improvement, define rele uh, relevant context and conditions, and examine effectiveness of support. Um, and really when summarizing this, we want to make sure just to go and be go beyond just giving that quantitative data and really make, make sense of the data. And I always think of the data and I think about it from like the parent perspective, let's make sure it makes sense um, for the parents to understand as well. Um, so just a quick question for you guys. I know we're, I don't wanna to take too much time, but um, you know, when you complete your present levels, um, what, what data do you see or you see your teams often turning to? The quantitative or the qualitative, or are they really good at using a mix of both? What, do you, what have you seen or do? <laughs> you're a special ed teacher. We definitely see both where, you know, we'll take present reading levels as measured by the reading room or, um, you know, we may determine the context, like the conditions of, of the, where the student is resistant to doing the work and is that, you know, factoring in to their ability to do the work, uh, whether their attention factors in or, um, you know, things like that. Thank you, Leslie. Anybody else? I think where this gets trickier is with the social emotional behavioral goals. Because some of those are a little bit harder because we don't have the access. So we can't just go give a quick reading assessment. So I think that's where sometimes you see more of the qualitative necessarily than a, a numerical. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, in those areas. Donna, I think it's great you're seeing qualitative information because I think, you know, we've been, it isn't a significant change in practice or a different in direction to be including both. But I think that, um, you know, in some places and for some people, there's been more of a focus on quantitative only. And in another place, you've seen more qualitative only, but the qualitative information that's shared might be subjective rather than objective. And so we're really wanting to kind of shore up that qualitative information that we're sharing that helps us understand a student present level. And Donna, you're absolutely right. When we're talking about social, emotional, behavioral needs that it's, it's harder to be quantitative in, in some, some circumstances. I'm sure there's a BCBA that would argue with me. And if you're on this, um, if you're here, you're welcome to, to share with us some methods for that. Um, and then Abby just mentioned in the in the chat, she says typically seeing the quantitative data in the current performance section and then the quali more qualitative in the strengths and concerns section. Certainly true. All right. 
So I'm not going to read this chart to you guys. You guys can just take a look at it here for a second. There's obviously um, lots of different assessment types, and this list is not exhaustive by any means, um, but it's just a good reference when determining what source of data can be used to inform the present levels. Um, you know, it's always just good to be mindful about the assessments that are used for present levels and establishing that baseline for, for the student um, it, for the progress monitoring piece, sorry. Um, and there really should be a mix of, of different types of assessments used, right, for the present levels. Um, so should we, I don't know, Sarah, do we have time to ask, ask a couple questions? I think we do. I, I think we have a few minutes. I wanted to note too, I think that this um, slide itself is also, I know we've talked multiple times over the course of this training today about newer educators. And I think this is a great reference for newer educators who might be struggling to understand the different kinds of assessment types um, because there's some examples they can then go look up. So this slide in of itself, if you're wanting to share some information with what kind of data you're looking for with your newer educators might be might be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, strengths and concerns. Um, present levels provide the baseline data performance of the student's strengths and concerns. It's important to note that baseline scores should be established using the same tool that will be used collecting ongoing monitoring data. This way, really we're comparing, right? If we're using the same assessment, we're really comparing like apples to apples. Um, the measurement tool should be reliable and a valid measurement of academic or functional performance and designed for ongoing use. Um, they really can use two types of tools to establish an IEP goal. One would be a single single measure skill or mastery measures used to, to assess really those specific discrete skills such as like two digit um, addition, right? And then also we can also use general outcome measures and those are really, um, sample skills that will be taught in any grade level curriculum when they focus on a skill that reflects the overall competence in a domain, such as something like maybe reading comprehension. We're gonna go into more detail about the goal writing and that process in future trainings. We're definitely gonna get into that a lot. Um, you know, also we need to just remember the critical role present levels plays when determining that meaningful benefit and the substantive requirement of IDEA. Um, okay, keep cruising. Sorry, I'm checking the chat while we're going to. Um, so here we have the parent and or student input section. Um, and really the shift here is really getting really good um, input from the parents based on the present levels and where we see the student. Um, you know, a lot of times we've seen they agree with the PPT and they're happy or things like that in the, the parent input section, but we really want to make them a part of the team and understand where their student is functioning and have them give input based on what the team is seeing as a whole. So it's really getting more specific also for each um, goal and having their input for each, each one of the present levels. Sorry if I said that wrong. Um, I think that was yeah behind this is that parent or student input may influence the information that we have that may lead us to look at those present levels a little bit differently when we think about our goal and objective creation um, and the and the use of those skills. Yep. Um, so here just really the the roles and in informing the present level. So it's really just, you know, the different people and, and how they can inform the present levels. So obviously a special education teacher provides knowledge of special education processes and services. Um, you know, I always go to the general ed teacher as a special ed teacher myself, I always would go to them because they know those content, content standards and looking at those standards um, to really inform those present levels. Um, student service personnel, they contribute to writing and the collection of data um, on the academic and functional present levels. And obviously paraprofessionals, they're very important. You know, they, they're collecting a lot of data for us a lot of the time. Um, so it's really important to know that everybody plays an important role and that everybody does have a role when it comes to um, creating these present levels for students. Um, 
quick, oh. sorry, there's a question in the chat about the role of the parent and what happens with the plop if a parent does not attend the PPT. I think that's a great question, um, certainly one that I'll, again, check on the response to, but re regardless of whether a parent is present at the PPT or allows us to hold a PPT without them, we are hopefully gathering their input over time. So there may be a conversation, some information you gather from a parent to gather, you know, information about those students' present levels that might not happen during the PPT, just as, just as if when you're gathering your present levels of information leading up to the PPT, you're doing that on an ongoing basis until you get there, and that's the point of documentation. Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at Bryson. So here we have Bryson um, and his academic strengths and area of concern. Um, so here on the left hand side, you can see his um, his standard score is from the Woodpack Johnson and then the strengths and concerns relating to those scores. And then on the right hand side, you can see Bryson's present levels um, for reading. So I just want everybody to take a few minutes to just kind of look at the information and look at how it's um, just really the content and how the data is used um, within the new, I'm not saying this right, I don't want to say it wrong, but go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to add, and let me see if I can use my annotate here. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt to do this. We'll see if it works. It might not. But this from earlier we were talking about where the assessment um, norm reference assessment data goes, the evaluation data versus the ongoing data. So on this side of the screen that you see right here that I'm attempting to circle doesn't really look like a circle. This information is in a different place in the new IEP than the information specific to the present levels for that IEP year. I'm going to show you the IEP later and you'll see that, but I don't want you to think you're looking at a screen that's going to show like this on the IEP. This information in the box on the left, it will be shown separately in the IEP from the information in the box on the right that I'm looking at. Right, so really just um, take a minute to, to look at this and look at the results from the Woodcock Johnson um, and identified strengths and area of concerns from that assessment, as well as then the present level data. Um, and note that the present level data and area of strengths of concerns come from the curriculum based measurements and assessments, while the Woodcock Johnson data now goes in that, like Sarah just said, additional data assessment area. Give you about two or three minutes to just review the information on this screen and then we'll do a quick discussion and we'll do the same thing with the behavior data that comes next. All right, so what are you guys um, taking from this as like noteworthy or different or readability?
So there's a question here from Leslie. The additional testing information section is split into goal areas, correct? Um, the additional testing information section, I don't believe is split into goal areas. I have to look at that more closely, Leslie, actually. I'm going to get back to you on that. I don't have a clear response for you at this time because I didn't think about it in that context and I don't want to answer incorrectly. Thank you. I was just wondering because if if we do, you know, like Woodcock Johnson tests of reading, writing, and math, input it all in one place, then how does the program parse out which of that data goes with the reading goal? Like, or is this not a page that the parent would see like all together? This is not a page. Nope. So this information okay. on the again, I'm gonna this information here is, is literally not in there. IEP from okay. this information over here. They're on different pages. They're in different sections. So we're just seeing it together. Yes. As so that you can look at information all in one place for the purpose of the content piece of this. Excellent. Um, and then this information on the left is the information that stays or remains because it's based on that evaluation. We had that conversation earlier. And this information on the right is the information that clears out every year. Right, okay. Um, Mary Jo has a comment about the new IEP format, eliciting more thorough analysis of the results leading to goal development, not just reporting of scores or concerns. Um, I think that's a great way um, to point out that you're right, we are gonna not just be thinking in terms of the overarching umbrella, right? We're gonna be thinking in terms of the discrete uh, skills or goals that go under that overarching umbrella or skill. And so what you see here is um, overall broad reading or um, basic skills and reading fluency are in the average range. And then over here, you see strengths, decoding and reading fluency, um, rate and attention to punctuation. So you see that it's like a further description of the skills that might be age appropriate or might be being worked on during that IEP cycle in terms of strengths and areas of need. It's not staying so global. And some of you may already have been doing that on your IEPs. I think there's been a lot of recent practice that I've seen that has drilled down to more specifics um, on IEPs. And for others, it might be more of a shift um, in, in thinking and th change in practice. All right. I think we're good. I think we can go on to the next one because it's kind of, um, it's very similar. So on the next slide here, we are going to look at um, Bryson's behavioral strengths and needs. Sorry, Sarah, <laughs> talking. Well, there we go. Um, so, you know, he's really receiving services primarily for um, emotionally disability there. This is the focus of his IEP. Though he has strengths and areas of concern related to behavior that need to be addressed in the present levels, um, just take a moment again to take a look at this, take a look at the results from the BASC and identify areas, um, strengths and areas of concern from that assessment, as well as that present level data. Um, same with the academic piece. Um, uh, it is it, the same applies for the behavior evaluation data. And note that the present levels and the areas of strengths and concerns come strict, strictly from those classroom um, school-based referrals, as well as FBA data. Well, the BAS data now goes into, you know, that separate section again. It's the same thing here as it was on the previous screen. They're in different sections. So we'll give you a couple minutes to, to look at this. Um, and then in about, at about 2.52, 2.53, we'll engage in quick discussion around this and move on to some other activities. I really like how you can separate out the like it doesn't have to be in a, a sentence because that's hard for parents to read when you're doing like BASC data. We, we don't have the ability to separate, sort it out like this. So I really like that. That's cool. Great to hear from that um, social emotional behavioral perspective. Thank you.
All right. So um, does anybody have any other comments, questions about this? We kind of just did it before in the academic um, sense, but looking at it from a behavioral perspective, does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns? It was already mentioned that the it's it's easier for the parents to understand and that's definitely um, the goal um, of this new system as well, or this training. <laughs> Maybe we're good to go. <laughs> okay. Guys, I heard our, a lot of the other groups had a lot to say about this, about this slide. Yeah. Um, I will move us forward. I think there's a lot to take in in the area of behavior. So um, Amanda did comment she likes how the present levels on the right-hand side are written in a narrative format, paint clear a picture. Um, so thank you, Amanda, for sharing that. All right. Um, I think this is, I think this is where I take it away. So um, just doing a quick time check, we have about 35 minutes left before our um, 3.30 closing time. We will have you fill out that survey again for about the last five minutes. And um, I'm actually going to stop sharing for a minute too, because I just think that helps people's brains a little bit sometimes to look at a different screen. So while we venture into the second course, half of this, I'll just mention that, oh, there's somebody here in the waiting room. Um, I'll just mention that we are gonna be doing some work looking at present levels. We probably aren't going to get through the remainder of this section today. It is some kind of heavy duty digging in and there's some time for you to think and respond. The next two sessions that we have after today are focused on goals and objectives, but we do have a little bit of wiggle room with time. So whatever we don't get to today, I'm not going to rush through. April and I will just take, pick up the presentation where we left off, do a quick review of present levels because it doesn't lend itself really nicely into like taking away the next goals and objectives section. All right, any comments, thoughts before I move on? All right, keeping it moving. All right, so here we're gonna talk about um, from data to impact statement. And um, I'm sure that everyone here is familiar with the impact statement um, in terms of how we see it on our current IEP. The impact statement is intended to um, describe the effect of the concerns and needs on the student's access to participation and progress um, in general education. And so that leads them to require specialized instruction in one or more academic areas, social situations, or community and work related related settings. Um, one of the things that's important to mention is we are going to be as specific as possible in our impact statements, just as we've been talking about being as specific as possible in our um, strengths and concerns and present levels data. So um, some quick reminders um, for some of you and new information for others is that we really want to stay away from labeling the disability and saying due to the student's autism or due to the student's learning disability, they have trouble reading. We're really lo looking for a description of the skill area that we're discussing in that section. So we might say that um, given the child's difficulty with verbal expression and understanding social, social cues um, as our description that, that then leads us to a goal around improving in those areas. Um, okay, moving right ahead, trying to just touch on the key points because of time here. Um, so here is another screenshot of when you're going to see um, on CT sides, this is how this will look. We'll see our present levels of performance, our strengths, our concerns and needs. And now we're onto this final area, the impact statement, which currently is our fourth column, I think, of our current present levels uh, pages. Um, and some of you may have noticed in the crosswalk um, that the impact statement remains as something that we're going to have. It's just in a different place in the new IEP. Okay, when writing an impact statement, um, we're being encouraged to think about this in top in terms of cause of concern and cause of concern and effect. So, what is the underlying area of need? Is it difficulty um, decoding um, 
words or specific or sentences is a difficulty, generating sentences, um, creating language, expression verbally, and then the effect. What is the effect um, on the student related to the grade level or anchor standards and their participation in the general education setting? So um, that, that idea of specificity is really what we're looking at here. I also took a minute just to kind of think of this in terms of if then. I know we use if then a lot with our kids. So I was kind of thinking through for myself, you know, if I take this as if there's these skill areas, then this impacts them in this way. And for me, that's another way to think through this that might help me create um, better impact statements that are, are more meaningful and speak more clearly to a student's areas of need. This slide is very straightforward. Again, we're gonna think of terms um, cause and effect. If the cause of concern is sequencing of information and ideas, the underlying area of need might be an understanding of temporal relationships. And then the effect of that is the impact on the ability to retell stories, follow directions, and complete multi-steps mathematic problems. The impact statement then might be weakness in understanding temporal relationships impacts the student's ability to retell stories follow directions in order, and complete multi-step mathematics problems. That right there, I don't believe is a complete impact statement. You're gonna see a complete impact statement a little bit later um, on another slide. So I just wanted to point that out as well. This is just think, taking you through that if-then thinking, or the, sorry, the cause-effect thinking. Okay, so now we're gonna take a moment to look at um, a rating scale. We're going to use this um, present levels component rating scale to look at some current IEPs and um, and some future what it'll look like in CT SEDS and think through that a little bit. Um, and then you're going to have an opportunity to look at your own IEPs that you brought with you today to do a little bit of thinking around where you are um, in your development or if you brought us one of your um, staff's IEPs, kind of where your staff might need to move in terms of improvement. So I'm just going to give you a minute to read through um, the eight questions on the screen. you earlier today when we started to kind of rate yourself using a similar rating one to five where you are in terms of I, I came up with one summary statement that pulls all of these statements together and you gave yourself a rating. So as you're looking now at this more broken down, I'm wondering if your average rating would come out to be similar to what you gave yourself at the beginning. Um, and that's something to think about. And the reason I point this out is because I think this is a great tool for helping people do some re review and self-reflection and understand um, what their current practice is around their present levels of performance um, and help them identify some areas they might want to strengthen as we transition to the new IEP form and the new IEP system. All right. So um, here on this slide, um, there's a lot of information. So hopefully you're able to view this. Um, you can also access it in Canvas. So it'll probably be larger if you access it there or if you downloaded these documents. And what you see is a current IEP format and the new IEP format. And what this slide does is it takes some old information and, and some new information and lets you look at it side by side. So here in the old IEP, um, we're gonna take a little bit of time to kind of think through that, that rating scale on um, those questions of one to five, uh, the ratings, sorry, of one to five um, as a group and compare them a little bit to when we get to this portion, the new IEP. All right, April, did I forget any key content information before I dive into the activity? Nope, and I put a PDF in the, in the chat, so if you need to see it in any bigger, um, it's there as well. 
Great. So let's start with this current format. Um, I'm actually going to, did you put, you put the PDF in the chat? That's great. So you guys might want to open that PDF because I'm actually going to screen share a different document for a minute. Or if you have access to the slide, if you're looking at the slides on your own, you'll also see it. You just won't see it through my screen share because I'm going to stop that. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to screen share a different screen. Are you seeing the one, two, three, four, five? Okay. Yes. So what I'm going to do is we're going to talk through these questions one, one by one, using, looking at this old current IEP format, just to give us a, some grounding. And if you could just use your annotate key, put any stamp that you want in to show us where you think the statement lands um, as I share it with you. So Sarah, question, could you just make it bigger? Mm, sure. Is it tiny? It's tiny. Sorry, guys. Let me turn off my annotate so I have a mouse to access. Yes, that's right. Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, does the present level that you're seeing under the current IEP format provide a descriptive snapshot of the student, including both strengths and areas of need. If you could rate that on a scale of one through five in terms of what you're seeing, again, in the current IEP. to access their annotate feature. Great. We're just answering number one. Does the plot provide a descriptive snapshot of the student, including both strengths and areas of need? If you just need a quick refresher, usually you just have to put your mouse around the top, it says view options, and then you click annotate, and then usually the little stamp or text will come up. You see some people here are noting that it's weak. Um, I'm gonna move forward and we'll try the next one with the annotate feature. Um, and if this is something that isn't working, we can certainly just go back to discussion style. I do see that um, April's refresher, which I should, should have thought of. Thank you, April. Um, more people are able to access that. So it looks like we're agreeing that it's fairly weak. Number two, the clear drawings. Um, concerns and needs are specific and require specialized instruction. Do we see evidence of that in the current one? So I see some people are noting that it's weak or very weak. Um, I think that it may be a little bit challenging for people to be accessing the annotate. So rather than spend a lot of time using a tool that's not working, I'm just gonna stop using it and shift us back to the slides. I feel like there's good days and bad days for using these tools. Maybe the end of the day is not the best time for it. I was struggling to find it too. Um, all right, number three, is the parent or guardian input present and clearly considered? You guys can just unmute and kind of, if someone just wants to share one or two people, like where, where do we think, it, is that clear? Is it a two, is it a three, is it a four? I see people putting in the chat some threes, some twos. 
Great. It does give us some information. They work better when they are able to have movement breaks, right? That would really inform some of our information. So perhaps it is kind of in that neutral area. Yes, Linda, we're looking at the current one, the one on the left-hand side. Yeah, let me just... All right, are the data understandable to the parents and guardians and or the teacher? Could anybody pick this up and understand what reading 10%, map reading 10% means? Or reading is a level M. Ones. I see lots of ones <laughs> yeah. coming through. This does not translate to uh, non-classroom educators or special educators. I know as a speech pathologist, sometimes even that would be hard for me to figure out depending on what I've been working on at the time. All right, our plot summary statements present for each skill area. Which, and we're only looking at one skill area right now, but is there a plop statement for this area? It does it match. does show that perhaps why there's a reading impact, but it doesn't, it's not specific to reading goals. It's more specific to behavioral goals. So would that go in a connected to a more behavioral section, I guess? Is that what you're saying, Jennifer? Okay. Yes, just that the impact, it's talking about impulsivity and attention that doesn't address written expression and spelling. Behavioral concern. Um, does the impact statement identify the deficits that underlie the student's specific disability? I think you just kind of shared that. Um, perhaps there is impulsivity in inattention that are impacting their ability to read and write, but it doesn't. There's no clear through line there. We're not seeing the link between all of these things. I, um, as I think, going back to what Jennifer was saying a few minutes ago. And could you write observable and measurable individualized goals based on these present levels? One to five. See some ones coming through. Ones and twos. Okay. So, um, you know, as you're seeing this, you may be saying to yourself, oh, well, our, our practice is different than that. We do this much more explicitly. And I just wanted to let you know if you're if you're sitting here thinking that you're in really great shape for moving to the new format um, and the new IEP system, because you're just really going to have to maintain that practice of thinking specifically and putting that information in a new format. Um, and this group so far seems to have some really great feedback and understanding about these components, which is great. So gold star on this Thursday afternoon. All right, for the sake of time, um, we would also, I think, be going through the new IEP format. Instead of doing this out loud, I just want you guys to look at that for a minute. Go through that rating on your own. We'll take four minutes just so that you can kind of help um, yourself conceptualize um, what this new IEP format is going to look like and how it helps maybe strengthen some of the answers to those ratings that we just provided. We'll come back together at 3, 4, uh, 313. So this will just be a quick, quick activity. I just put that um, the questions in the chat there so you guys could see have those too with this.
Hi, right. any big ahas or takeaways from doing a quick review of um, the academic present levels in the new IEP format? It can either be a comparison statement or just something that you find interesting um, or perhaps more developed, better developed about the new format. Any thoughts or comments, you can put it in the chat or unmute yourself and say it out loud. Greater details and data, strengths and weaknesses. Thank you, Amy. One of the things I like about it is that it's just, I feel like it's, it's clear and concrete. Like I feel like I could draw an arrow from top to bottom helps with impact statement and goals and objectives. Great. I'm going to move us forward. I'm going to show you one more slide. Um, it is, let me stop this. Okay, so this is a behavior impact statement. Um, this is the current format of our IEP compared to the new format. And so what we're going to do for about the next seven minutes is I'm just going to give you some quiet time. You can turn off your screen if your screen's on to look at, um, I love Jeff's comment, not just chunks of info, meaningful info. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and Dana's too about the landscape form, encouraging thoughts as opposed to bullets. That's great. All right, so getting back to this, you're going to look at that rating scale and you're going to kind of compare the new format and the old format and just kind of think through um, as you look at each one, um, the differences between the old format and the new format in terms of our ability to make them, them more specific and perhaps give them a higher rating on that rating scale. We will come back together at 322 after you've had some time to do that. Um, have a quick check-in. Hopefully a couple people will have some um, big takeaways to share. You can put them in the chat before then if you want, and I'll just review them. And then we'll talk about um, next steps and we'll dive into our own IEPs um, during the start of the next session. So I will turn us back on at 322.
Okay, I'm going to bring us back together and just look for a couple people, uh, maybe a couple of different people, if you're willing to share some thoughts on what you see here in terms of the behavior data and its specificity, the impact statement and its specificity, um, or any other thoughts you may have. If somebody's typing, I'll share what Amy had mentioned earlier in the chat. Amy mentioned that the new format really allows for greater details, um, which gives the reader a better overall picture of the student. Um, and then building on that, Amy, it also then allows for the team to understand why they're doing what they're doing for interventions eventually, right? Because it goes back to that present level data. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Don mentioned that is so detailed and so specific um, that it allows the team to create more authentic and reliable goals to be able to show growth down the road. Great point. So now we're looking at that progress monitoring and continued growth. We're thinking back around that loop, a visual that we saw earlier. I really appreciated here um, the ability to note like the PPT has convened this many times to think through uh, adjustments and needs. Um, I thought that that was a really interesting way. And that is data, right? How many times you come together to review and revise a student's program is important information. I know that's a specific thing, but it was something I found interesting as I try to fill the air. Does anybody have any uh, in the states that I can imagine that meetings will require more time in order to complete the IEP. Um, I'm not sure about that, Linda. The, right now, um, to respond to that, what's happening is the 20 pilot districts are engaging in creation of some um, mini sessions to move information from old, old IEPs to the new IEP format. So I think we'll get some more information moving forward about um, about that. I don't know that PPTs will take longer. I do think with any kind of change, it might take us a little while to get used to where we put the new information as we're planning or drafting for the meeting. And then afterwards as well, as we're documenting and making the changes uh, about things that came up during the meeting and as the team made decisions about what they're going to do and, and how they're going to approach programming. That will be seen. If parents are giving input on each separately, it may take a little longer. Leslie, that's a great point. But again, I don't think the intention is that we have to only gather our parent input during the meeting. I think, you know, we're gathering input from them ongoing because it's part of our baseline data. They also may be presenting information at the meeting. I am going to look into that for you because that's kind of my take on it. And I want to make sure that that's accurate. Um, but if we're, if we're going through in this way, it may take longer or it may create some efficiencies once we all get used to it. That will allow us to move through things a little bit more quickly. Again, we'll see, right? We'll, we'll know after July 1st <laughs> and we can have this conversation then. Um, okay, I'm gonna move us forward. Um, what I'm gonna do here is the activity, the next activity that we were going to do was related to the IEPs that you all brought with you. Um, so you'll have those for next week. We're gonna start the session next week with some um, breakout activity where you dig into your current IEPs without sharing any confidential information and look at the ratings in terms of where you land and how you're gonna think through next steps. So I'm gonna skip those slides at this point in time, because we'll I just start- I wanted to say one thing, Sarah, before you moved on. Just looking at the, if you take a look at the case studies on Canvas, it does really, it outlines the format, because I, I know we've been getting a lot of these formatting questions for the new IEP, um, and you might get a really good sense of how the layout is if you take a look at one of those case studies and you just, you can click go to IEP and just see the IEP section. Yeah, and if anybody wants to stay on at 3.30, we're happy to walk through one with you. Um, we, are, we are here for, so. You may not be, but we're here if you want us to be. 
Um, so we're going to do this next time. I do want to just do some wrap up and then we'll do I'll do a quick review of this at the start of the next session so that we can dive in. So pulling it all together, this is the writing the present levels of performance page. You saw this graphic earlier. We need to ensure that it's color, current, relevant, factual, whoops, um, measurable and understandable. Those are the things that we're looking for on our present levels, that it addresses student needs, has clear baseline information which um, shows us the effect on the progress in the general education and is clearly connected to goals and or services. And looping us all the way back around to last week when we spent a lot of time talking about Andrew, um, the takeaway here is that if you don't have a clear understanding of the impact of a student's disability, you cannot provide that student with appropriate services to ensure meaningful progress under Andrew. And so that is why we really need to have that specificity of information to show that we understand the student's disability and that we have enough information to plan an effective program for that student to access FAPE and make uh, adequate progress. Um, the present levels is the foundation of the IEP. We are going to talk more about this moving forward. We have the requirements, the rationale, and the legal basis. Um, there was a full handout that we shared with you last week that gets into these components as well. Um, I love these like graphics where I can just look across and it gives me a clear understanding and a snapshot, especially when I start to second guess myself because I'm doing things so many times. So I'm really looking forward to using these resources moving forward. And then um, we will drop in the chat. April, do you have that copied or do you want me to? Um, this is the assessment or the evaluation of the content of today's session. This feedback does go directly to, S to the SDE and AIR so that they're able to take your um, information about the content that is shared in the format in which it's shared um, to move forward um, to make any adjustments or changes for future sessions. So thank you all for coming on your snow day, if you had one, and joining us on this late afternoon. Um, look forward to starting off digging into IEPs the next time we come together and to talking about goals and objectives. Um, and April and I will be here for a bit while you finish up your evaluations and to answer any questions you have or to take take you for a little, a little jaunt through the, one of the new IEPs. Thanks everyone. April, I didn't share the session preparation slide, so what I'll do when we close is I'll send out a Canvas announcement that just reminds people of the things very early on that will help them prepare for next week. Yep, that sounds good. Hi. I just had a question. Sure. Um, as I, I, I like the new format and I'm, you know, think the